Welcome to another segment of the Grassy Knoll. We're recording this on February 13th, 2005. With us today is Paul Collins. He's an author, uh, and he's uh, also contributing to a series uh, that is um, including his brother Philip in a series titled Magicians of Mutability. This is Visigoth. Uh, Harry's not with us today. And um, we want to tell you that, uh, not that you should get confused, but uh, the, these two Collins brothers have done some kind of work on what is going on today and its roots back uh, centuries ago. And, uh, Paul, you are the author of The Hidden Face of Terrorism. That's correct. And the co-author with Philip in The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship and Examination of the Epistemic Autocracy from the 19th to the 21st Century. Do you guys have a third work uh, coming up at all, or are you planning another book? What we're planning on doing is we're taking the second book, the uh, the Ascendancy, and we're going to write an expanded, revised version that's already in the works. And basically, we're going to move a few things around in the original, and we're going to expand upon several of the ideas uh, that we expounded in the uh, in the first edition. Uh, there was just so much more that could have been said about the issue that uh, it's something that we needed to do, and so that's what we're uh, working on right now. All right, before we get into the uh, topic for today, which is the Venetian oligarchy, uh, can you give us a thumbnail of uh, what one could find in your book, The Hidden Face of Terrorism? Sure. Well, The Hidden Face of Terrorism basically takes to task the uh, the orthodox academia uh, model of what terrorism is. It, it, it takes the assertions put, put forward by the mainstream universities and mainstream, uh, university instructors, uh, the, the contention that, that terrorism is just the act of lone nuts with no funding from governments or, or no government sponsorship, uh, whatsoever. Uh, it, it takes that apart. It takes that idea apart and uh, basically uh, puts forward the contention that terrorism is not so much the act of, of lone nut groups, uh, uh, just small groups of disenfranchised misfits and, and radicals who are venting their frustration through acts of terrorism. Instead, terrorism is, is a well-coordinated, Social engineering project uh, carried out with b b with sponsorship and shepherding and funding from from national governments, and those national governments in turn are being controlled by a, a group that exists above government, um, the elite, the power elite, and this pa uh, this uh, social engineering project is geared towards uh, towards breaking down. Uh, the the human uh, psyche, the breaking down the personality and building a new per, a new personality, one that one that favors security over freedom, and uh, and is willing to actually trade uh, freedom for for security, which is not really security at all, but an illusion of security. And we saw this with 9/11. People were absolutely scared to death. They were. Uh, they were shocked and, and traumatized into basically pliable lumps of clay that the uh, that the elite could uh, sculpt in any form that they liked and uh, and wished to and uh, and uh, the people uh, you know backed the president and backed the uh, the idea of of uh, homeland security apparatus which is, uh, bears ominous parallels. To uh, to the uh, security apparatus of several socialist regimes, uh, National Socialism in particular, Germany, and uh, and uh, also uh, the uh, security apparatus in uh, in the Soviet Union, and in both of those cases, uh, so the security apparatus was more geared towards uh, war on the people, war on the population, war on dissent than it was on terrorism and, and then more than it was uh, geared towards procuring uh, uh, security for for the people and uh, the book is by no means a, a comprehensive look at the uh, at at the uh, whole phenomenon uh, of state sponsored terrorism but it 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 lays out the case studies uh, 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 well enough to where people should get a sense 
of what terrorism really is all about. Terrorism is, is not a new trick, is it, though? No, uh-uh. As a matter of fact, it goes back nearly 6,000 years in, in, in history uh, to, to uh, Kush, who was the uh, father of Nimrod. Uh, Kush means confounder, and that's exactly what he, di- he did. He'd, he'd confound people by sending uh, these uh, rogues and, uh, and uh, rabble, rabble-rousers into various city-states and, and, and thugs and whatnot, and they would uh, begin to generate uh, terror. And then he would show up on the scene offering the solution to, to, to that problem, offering the, to bring peace and to bring back stability on the condition that the people would, would hand the city over to him and make, it, make, make him the ruler. And uh, they they inevitably did, and the the, uh, the all the chaos would you know magically disappear, and all, and really what was going on was that these these uh, you know uh, thugs that he uh, that were in his employ uh, would you know uh, cease to uh, to carry out the chaos on on order of of Kush, and uh, the city was. Uh, thus handed over to him, and so this this method has been recycled down through through the years over and and over and over again and it's uh it's just i've I've marveled at the fact that that very few people have caught on to to this to this method and that's that's one of the reasons for writing the book was 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 maybe not to so much give a comprehensive uh, uh, study into into state sponsored terrorism and and look at all of the cases which would have took uh, took uh, thousands of, of of hours of research and st- and study, but to uh, but to take a few select cases and to uh, introduce people to the method. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, it's a good thing that you get out as much work as you can because no one ever really knows when that all might be brought to a swift end. So. Uh if you can get out less quicker, it's probably a good thing for the people because they need as much information as they can. And I guess what I'm saying is to try to do, say, a, a Carol Quigley-sized work, who knows how many years that would take, and it just might not ever get out there. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's good that you get out what you can and when you can. Uh, one of the other things, Paul, is that, you know, it seems every generation has to deal with a terror element. And we did a show on a speech that was given up in Harvard, uh, by a New York Republican in which he warns about the trend in the United States society and this willingness, it seemed, to s- sacrifice freedom for security. But what was interesting about the speech was is that it was given in uh, April of 1955. So here was a gentleman, his name was James Lord O'Brien, who was telling people in that year, watch out what's taking place. And, of course, the boogeyman back then, Paul, was communism. Well, the communism was from the beginning uh, propped up and, and funded by people in the West, uh, Western mm-hmm. factions of the elite, uh, to, to to create an, an an enemy that 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 would cause the people to rally ar- around the Western uh, faction of the elite, and uh, the Western faction, ironically, would offer as the solution. Uh, their own unique uh, socialist model. Uh, they they offered up basically a a, a, a united uh, socialist world that would act as a bulwark to the uh, communist Im- Im- imperium. And uh, I believe with Vladimir Putin in power now, and I believe with uh, the sweeping changes that are happening uh, under his uh, g- under his guard. Uh, that that we might see that kind of uh, situation arising again. I think that we might see another Cold War situation, and I th- and of course that'll frighten the living daylights out of people, and, and people will once more rally around the you know the Western mm-hmm. faction of the elite, and the, and they will once more offer up you know their their own uh, kind of police state conditions as as the solution to to that uh, to that growing menace over there and as a matter of fact in the ascendancy of the scientific dictatorship we we take a look at the at the in the very tail end of the book at what what uh, is coming down the road and we we uh, 
take the body of evidence concerning Russia and take the body of evidence concerning China and uh, show that, that they are being built up and that they are uh, getting brave again and that the cosmetic changes, and that's really all they were, cosmetic changes in Russia, uh, are dro- dropping away and it's uh, beginning to become a uh, a, 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 f- a model for opposition again. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see that uh, whole Hegelian dialectic that uh, was was carried out during the Cold War start, uh, starting all over again. Uh, the one problem, however, that I point out in the book and that uh, Philip and I both point out, I uh, should say, is that that this time they the elite in in the West might not be able to manage it as well as they did during the Cold War, and uh, it might actually spill out into overt war, overt war between uh, nation states. And one last question: As we turn ourselves from um, what you had written about in the hidden face of terrorism, um, it's it's not a good idea sometimes to try to time events. But I'm going to ask you, just out of my curiosity, what stage or phase or uh, period are we in with regard to a uh, cataclysmic event? I mean, are we decades away? Do you think, or you know, what's your what's your take on that? I would actually. I don't want to sound like an alarmist, but I see something happening this this year. Um, what it what it could be, I could uh, could only hypothesize. Um, there's too many too many factors in the long term to say. Well, it will be this, or it will be that. That it will be uh, you know war with this this country, or that it will be uh, uh, you know an, a massive terrorist event coming from this uh, sector. Uh, but I see something happening because plants have been accelerated because uh, the the elite have a have an uh, have a uh, they they understand that their that their system is not based on reality. It doesn't commune with reality, and uh, they're trying to outrace its its uh, its collapse, and so they have to uh, accelerate. Uh, the 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 plan in a, in a hopes of in a hopes of uh, pre- preventing the whole system from from falling apart. So uh, I believe that that we we can certainly look for and see things uh, in, in terms of terrorism and in, in terms of other uh, chaotic kind of events uh, as early as this year. Uh, the topic for this show. Uh I guess we could call it a study of the Venetian oligarchy. And just uh, as a point of interest, uh, I, interviewed, I interviewed Joan Vion a couple of days ago, and she had just put out a newsletter that talked about uh, the fact that, these are my words, but uh, the British Empire or the, uh, the death of the British Empire has been rather premature, and she explained what had happened. And uh, she had also said about uh, Soviet Union, when both these nations supposedly decolonized or streamlined or whatever, um, they still, by, um, I guess you could say, um, fear of reprisal, still control the votes of those decolonized uh, nations. So whereas England only had one vote in the U.N., now they have 54. Whereas the Soviet Union only had one vote, now they have 13. So on paper, it looks like they decolonized, if you will, but actually they probably gained more strength in this uh, world forum of the UN. Uh, But uh, looking back at Britain now, because um, I think we feel very much the same way, that that's a center of of what is going on with this global takeover. Uh, How does, what is the Venetian uh, oligarchy, and what is its ties uh, to uh, Great Britain? Well, we see the beginning of the Venetian oligarchy with him and his descendants. Uh, they basically began the post-flood rebellion against uh, God, and uh, um, Ham had basically uh, d- done something to offend his father Noah. Uh, uh, many people have theorized that it was quite possibly uh, a homosexual rape. Uh, rabbinical tradition holds that that uh, this was the case, and that Ham's son Canaan was involved. And uh, Canaan, as a result of whatever they had done, was cursed by uh, by Noah. And uh, the Canaanites 
uh, carried a, a kind of spirit of defiance. I'm, I'm kind of verging over into the realm of of spirituality now, but uh, mm-hmm. I kind of find it as un, as an unavoidable uh, dim, dimension to all this. So but, do we, right? But they they have a spirit of defiance, and uh, they basically turned away from uh, traditional worship, the worship of the Lord, and chose to uh, worship uh, Baal. And Baal was simply another name for Cush, uh, and it, who was the was the father of Nimrod. And worship of Baal involved uh, child sacrifice and mm-hmm. ritual prostitution, and uh, the Lord considered this an abomination. And and in uh, we see uh, God in uh, in Joshua uh, chapter th- uh, three verse ten. Uh, saying that he would uh, drive the Canaanites out of the land before the uh, before the Hebrews, as a result of everything that they were doing, because of of the uh, the, the, the the depravity and the infanticide, and uh, the Canaanites, however, they did not cease to exist. Um, they, they, uh, the the there was a fairly large population of of Canaanites that. Uh, stayed in the tribal lands, and the, the Israelites chose not to uh, push them out. And as a result, uh, they intermingled with these uh, these Canaanites, and that preserved a lot of their uh, their occult practices. And remnants of the uh, Canaanites changed their uh, identity after, uh, I believe, 12 B.C. They became known as the uh, well, 1200 B.C. Uh, to, uh, rather, uh, they became known as the Phoenicians. And in A.D. Uh, 466, the Canaanite Phoenicians uh, uh, established a city uh, known as Venice. And Venice was a major uh, center of commerce for the Mediterranean region. And uh, the Canaanites now called themselves Phoenicians, and they continued with the occult traditions of Ham, Canaan, uh, Cush, and Nimrod. And Venice would provide the Babylonian mystery religion with a conduit to the modern world. They would use their wealth to accumulate that that they had accumulated from their monopoly over commerce uh, to conduct a covert war against the the, the Christian world, against the traditional uh, uh, way of life. And uh, Rosicrucianism was part of that project. And it is in Rosicrucianism that one finds the origins of Freemasonry. And uh, Freemasonry would, from the top of, of British society, from the top of English society, right on down, uh, take over and gain dominance. Uh, but uh, we'd have, we have to follow an outline to get there. Um, Rosicrucianism began with a Venetian friar and uh, and Kabbalist who was uh, named Francesco uh, Zorzi, which is spelled Z-O-R-Z-I. And his family was one of the top ruling families of Venice. And he was also the author of uh, of a work that uh, contained a lot of uh, Kabbalistic, Hebrew Kabbalistic ideas. And uh, he had a, another work, which was a manual for magic, and uh, and claimed that uh, that that cr- that the uh, angels would guard those who who practiced that magic. And in 1529, he traveled to England to act as an advisor, or misadvisor is probably a more appropriate term, to Henry VIII. And in that position, uh, the friar provided uh, Henry with a theological loophole to justify divorcing his wife Catherine of Aragon the uh, of Aragon uh, rather uh, the daughter of the king of Spain and with Catherine successfully removed uh, Henry could marry Anne Boleyn whose family was also uh, uh, had a Venetian background um, then the reason for that manipulation on Zorzi's part was to prevent an alliance between Spain and England that might bring about a second League of Cambrai. See, in 1509, the uh, the League of Cambrai, which had been uh, called together by the papacy, had declared war on Venice, and it came very close to destroying Venice. 
but uh, the papacy ended up breaking the league up and making a, a peace with uh, with Venice. And uh, but Zorzi uh, or Zorzi rather, however you pronounce it, remained in the court of of Henry VIII until his death in 1540. And it is there that the, that the friar is said to have uh, began a, a school of initiation into uh, different mysteries and different uh, um, known as, uh, as Rosicrucianism. Let me. Can I ask you a question there too, yeah. Paul? All right. So this situation with Henry VIII and the divorce of Catherine. One is this is this the situation that cost Thomas More his head? Um. I, I believe that that somehow is involved. There's a trajectory. There's a trajectory there, and all. It, what what it's it, it's it's basically the beginning of a of a of of a of a split in uh, in in uh, in Christendom and and some of Thomas More's ideas uh, being being rejected. Uh, and uh, but uh, Philip is really a. Uh, 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 expert on 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 Thomas okay. on, on Thomas More and and on the role that that he played in all of this. Well, did the papacy object to the divorce, or did they did they at least nominally object, but really it was okay with them? Um, it's my opinion that they that they objected objected entirely. Okay, and uh, and uh, the, the and it, this is why you know Henry VIII basically you know. Uh, told them where, where where to get off, basically, and uh, uh, but um, it, it should be noted that the, that the papacy has is is by no means uh, lily white, and uh, that that they uh, have their faults and they have their uh, their played a played a played a role in in uh, the sorry state of world affairs, um, but. Uh, the thing is, is that there is also evidence to suggest that the Priory of Sion was involved with the formation of the Rosicrucians, mm -hmm. and so we see a tie over into the work of uh, Bainchet Lee and Link in, in their book, uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, right. um, th because an adept known as uh, Ormus, who supposedly laid the foundation for the Priory of Sion, had his sect. Uh, this this uh, sect that he started uh, 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 as his sect symbol a, was a uh, cross surmounted by a rose, and the uh, Templars, uh, the Templar Knights, eventually took the emblem of the red cross, while the uh, Rosicrucians claimed the rose as their symbol. And um, it should also be noted that in the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Uh, the the authors point out that the Priory of Sion was supposed to have a second subtitle. Uh, uh, well, they were supposed to have one subtitle known as Ormus, uh, the name of this adept. And uh, uh, outside of that, they were supposed to have as as another subtitle the Order de la Rose, Rose uh, Cro, um, Cross uh, Veritas, and. Uh, they were basically probably the power behind the uh, behind the Rosicrucians, but through the Rosicrucians, the Venetian oligarchs were uh, able to hatch a plan to divide Christendom. Uh, and like I said, uh, the Catholic Church was teeming with corruption and theological and doctrinal error, but it should it, it still to an extent served as an umbrella for the majority of those adhering to the Christian faith. Um, uh, and if the proper and necessary reformations were were to be initiated, then Christian civilization could have been steered back onto the uh, straight and narrow path. Uh, but to the Venetian ruling class, that was that was unthinkable. Um, so the Rosicrucian order f moved to control uh, the Reformation movement, and they did so through uh, Mar Martin Luther. Now Martin Luther I don't want to vi uh, I don't want to uh, vilify the man. Uh I I believe that he that much of his work was needed and it's it was it was very important what he did and I believe that he uh, as a as a Christian I believe that he received a degree of revelation from from God. But it should be noted that uh, Luther's personal seal 
presents us with evidence of the Rosicrucian influence and control. Um, it, it consisted of his initials, and on, uh, and then it had uh, the rose on it and the cross, and those are chief symbols of the Rosicrucian order. And uh, Luther's ideas uh, sometimes contained Gnostic concepts that paralleled the Rosicrucian be- uh, beliefs. Um, as a matter of fact, one of his associates, Philip Melanchthon, uh, saw, uh, said that that Luther uh, he saw Luther's work uh, as quote unquote Manichaean uh, delirium. Manichaeanism is uh, is uh, is Gnosticism, uh, but but uh, Luther uh, Luther uh, wrote against some of August, uh, Augustine's. Uh, ideas. Um, he he he, uh, he wrote that 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 uh, Luther's ideas that that Manichaeanism was bad was actually was actually an error. Uh, see, uh, um, uh, uh, Augustine was involved in in Gnosticism for a time, and. Uh, and he uh, he eventually broke with it and uh, had written several uh, critiques of it. And uh, Luther found found actually the ideas of Manichaeanism to be uh, favorable and and desirable over uh, Augustine's ideas, and and uh, was a, and totally uh, objected to Augustine's uh, criticisms. Um, but uh, it would be it. It, it would be instructive to probably look at Manichaeanism for uh, the tenets and the beliefs uh, a little bit. Um, the Manich- uh, the they they were started by uh, an, an individual known as Manny, and Manny saw himself as above Jesus. He said that Jesus was merely his forerunner. But what the Manichaeans said was that the earth and all material things are of negative value that they are that this is in fact a prison and because the physical realm experiences what they consider to be decay and entropy it, it it's it's evil and and uh that's not that's not uh, true biblically if we see in as we see in first uh, corinthians uh chapter 3 verses 16 through 17 uh, the body is considered a temple of God, where the where the spirit of God is supposed to dwell. But uh, they saw our bodies as transient shells, and uh, and they uh, they believed the the the, uh, the God of the Bible to be evil because he was the creator of the material universe, and their uh, their attitude was was that he was trapping pure spirit. In in a uh, in, in a physical in a in a physical shell, and and there and therefore uh, he, he was actually uh, an evil, vindictive, cruel god, and that the uh, serpent in the uh, in the garden was was uh, was the actual hero hero of of the uh, Genesis account because he was uh, liberating man from from this and. Uh, from 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 the chains and the, the, that the, the the traditional god that we recognize had placed them in, and uh, we unfortunately see some some Gnostic beliefs uh, creeping into creeping into uh, Protestantism uh, as a re, as a result of this influence on uh, on uh, the life of of Luther. And uh, um, it, it's it, it, what 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 eventually happened was that the uh, that the uh, Rosicrucians uh, used uh, the Protestant Reformation as a way to uh, politically weaken uh, their 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 enemy, their traditional enemy, the uh, the, the 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 Catholic Church, and. Uh, this worked in in a lot of ways. Christianity was uh, was cut right down the, the middle, and uh, and two different camps had formed as a result: uh, the Protestants and the, and the Catholics. Uh, but eventually, even the uh, Protestants would begin to uh, to push out this this uh, influence. Uh, 
they begin to push this Gnostic influence uh, uh, out, and and it's not it's not as prevalent today as it was uh, was back then. But the damage was already done. If you look around the in the modern world today. Uh, there are countless, numerous denominations. We we don't see anything that we could uh, come close to describing as unity between uh, Christian brothers and sisters in the Christian world. Paul, if I could ask you a question. Sure. This this Harry would have asked you if he were here because we had this discussion, and I kind of thought, I, you know, I, I didn't really go along with it, but honestly, I, I you know, I'm I've got to ask it for Harry. He showed me one day something very interesting, and um, I had been brought up Lutheran. And he showed me the symbol that I had always seen in the church uh, on the uh, Christian flags, uh, you know, on the on the, uh, the pastor. And that was the symbol of Lutheranism. Is is it not a, a cross and a rose? That's that's correct. That's yes. Uh, you're actually reiterating what I yeah, yeah. what I just said. Right. Yes. Yes, so, but the thing is now, where that's only symb- uh, uh, symbolism. Now you're saying uh, it's a, it is fact that Ros- Rosicrucianism had an impact uh, on Luther. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, now I I assert uh, I I, uh, I don't see him as having some kind of sinister motives, and I don't mm-hmm. see him as being some uh, character of high villainy. I think that he was a well-meaning. Uh, uh, a genuine Christian. Uh, it's it's interesting that that when Philip Melanchthon had fell deathly ill at one point in his life, that that Luther uh, came and prayed for Melanchthon, and Melanchthon was was uh, miraculously made well. And the man was virtually on his deathbed at the time. So I do believe that that the that the Lord. Uh, worked through him the, to to a degree, um, but but it should be said that that uh, when you look at the undercurrents of of history, when you look into uh, uh, to what makes up the uh, conspiratorial uh, dimension uh, of of history, you have uh, two groups. You have those who are very much aware of what they are doing, and then you have uh, unwitting dupes who who are very good hearted and who uh who believe themselves to actually uh be working be working for the right and have no idea that that their sponsors or or the influences on the uh, on their thinking uh might have a, have a different agenda and that's what i think you see with 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 uh with luther and all so 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 that we don't uh throw the baby out with the right. with the bathwater but uh, if we could clarify one thing if you can speak to this and that is luther did not necessarily come up with that uh symbol did he or i mean did that come after him is that the work of something or someone else that's a, that's that's probably the work of somebody else it should be noted that he had uh in the book uh the Gods of Eden, uh, William Bromley points out that he had uh, been involved with, with, a, with a group uh, known as the Friends of God, which had several uh, um, occult ideas and, and several uh, Rosicrucian uh, ideas uh, as, as their tenets. And it is possible that that's uh, that that's where the uh, the, uh, the the symbols and and the, the ideas bef- b- behind those symbols uh, originated. Uh, I believe that the, the friends of God were uh, started by an individual named Mershwin, and I believe that he had come in contact with with Luther. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that that Luther, though, consciously comprehended. Anything that was was being be, being fed to him, uh, it, it should be noted that historically, uh, secret societies and esoteric groups have always had a had a cover story. They've had one version of their doctrine that was meant for the uh, for the masses, for for those who they considered to be vulgar, and then they had an an inner doctrine for the uh, for the for the true. Uh, Initiates and for those who were at the heart and soul 
in core of the group and knew what the group's true objectives uh, were. You just described, really, the whole strategy and the, the infrastructure, if you will, of most secret societies. And I'm thinking about Freemasonry in particular with Pike's remarks about how he would keep lower degrees uh, definitely in the dark about what the great plan was. Yeah, that's correct. In the uh, Morals and Dogma, he, he stated that the Blue Lodges were to be but a por- portico, uh, you know, but uh, just a window on, on, real, on real masonry. And uh, uh, it, it, that's why it's so important when, when going into the topic of, of masonry uh, to, to handle, uh, you know, individual m- members with, with care. Um, uh, because because uh, so many of them are are really basically real sol- salt of the earth uh, kind of in- individuals. I, I I have to say that I, I've known a lot of uh, fr- rank and file Freemasons uh, that live in the area in in the, in the places that I frequent that that uh are are very nice people very mm-hmm. good mm-hmm. and uh and see themselves as engaged in in something fraternal and see it as merely an opportunity to uh to uh give something back to the public mm-hmm. uh, a chance to uh, uh a chance to help people uh it would be it would be wrong to say that the that the shriners hospital right. hasn't hasn't done its its fair share right. of 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 good work uh and the, the the reason for this is that these people are by and large com- completely ignorant to what it is that they're the, the uh, they're involved in uh so ignorant to uh, in fact that they uh can see no qualms with uh with uh, going to the lodge on Wednesday night or or whenever they meet and then uh and then uh doing their dutiful service in in uh, whatever church of their choice on on Sunday as a last look at this bit about symbolism and we were just talking about the lutheran uh symbolism which um, yeah has a, has definitely a, a resemblance to uh, the the rose cross um, it wouldn't be the first time that questionable or even occult symbolism has seeped into the church and it reminds me also of morals and dogma and pike had a, a page uh, in which there were some graphics uh, crudely uh, placed in there like like by freehand almost that looked and he said he almost laughed at christians uh, when they uh, embraced for instance and i think you remember all this also in protestantism and also in catholicism that that p letter p looking um figure with an extended shaft more or less with the x that goes across it mm-hmm. and he said that dates back to um uh the resh i guess from um uh, egyptian sun god worship like a staff of sorts uh he also showed the um the star of david and and that is clearly masonic whether you want to call it interlocking pyramids or uh, c- uh compasses but that the church really has embraced quite a bit in fact i just got a uh, um a, an article which i think i passed along to philip i don't know if you saw it and it was basically saying Happy Ishtar instead of Happy Easter, showing how that uh, particular Christian, I won't say holiday, but event, was hijacked by uh, occult forces. And that well, goes back to Nimrod as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it happens around the time of, of, of the vernal equinox. Right. We, uh, we know that the uh, rabbit, which is a prevalent symbol, is a sign of fertility, right. which goes back to the, the fertility uh the the fertility worships and and aspects of of the of of the nimrod mysteries you know um the the idea that that the sun uh which uh represents uh nimrod uh impregnates uh semiramis uh mm-hmm. which is represented by by the earth and and sprouts uh sprouts life mm-hmm. and um and you know then the egg which is another symbol and uh in, uh, of of Easter is is a very very important uh, symbol to uh, to occult groups and uh, and yeah the um, Christians have uh, have basically uh, you know t- taken these as as their own and right. uh, really haven't uh, given much thought uh, beyond the surface explanation for uh, for what these what these symbols uh, uh, mean. Well, a last remark. Uh, I started thinking about this as I read it, and I said, "Yeah, you know, I, I circulated it, and 
most people bore witness with it. And I would even have to go as far as saying that low those many sunrise surfaces, uh, services I attended probably also had a little bit of an occult tinge in the fact of the sun rising, right? Right. Yeah. R- right. So, oh well. It's 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 a it's a it's a sad state of a of affairs. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, I think that most people are are genuine in in their in their sentiments. Uh, not that not not that I believe that that God will by any means overlook overlook ignorance, uh, but but uh, I believe that because they're they're genuine that eventually there's going to be some kind of awakening and uh, at least a remnant, uh, at least a portion of the Christian world is going to come out of a lot of this nonsense and. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Oh, go go on. Go All right, on. At this point, let's do some business because we haven't given you an opportunity to talk about where people can purchase the book. Uh, we want to remind people that we are uh, talking with Paul Collins. He is the author of The Hidden Face of Terrorism. And with his brother Philip, he has co-authored The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship, an examination of the epistemic autocracy from the 19th to the 21st century. Now, number one. How can people uh, purchase that book? Where are the venues where that happens? Okay, they can uh, basically get it at the uh, Barnes & Noble website, uh, barnesandnoble.com. They can get it also at amazon.com. Uh, the second book can be published at iuniverse.com, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, all one word, uh, I believe, all lowercase. Right, right. And then uh, the other one, uh, the other book, uh, The Hidden Face of Terrorism, can be pu- uh, purchased at uh, Author House, all one word, all lowercase, dot com. And uh, I know that if they uh, pu- if they buy it through uh, through Barnes and Noble and through uh, Amazon dot com, that those two have rather uh, quick and uh, speedy uh, shipping, and it should be to them in, in no time. Also, are there any websites where either excerpts of the books appear or articles uh, by yourself uh, and Philip too? Yes, actually, there is. Um, uh, Philip has some uh, some of his uh, writings that appear in the book at at, uh, at I believe biped dot info. That's right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and. Uh, and uh, I have uh, some articles at, uh, at Paranoia, uh, well, actually one article at ParanoiaMagazine.com over the psychology of Abu Ghraib. And um, oh, let me think here. Um, I, uh, News with Views also carried, uh, NewsWithViews.com also carried an article that uh, that Philip wrote over, uh, entitled "The Alchemy of Eugenics," and uh, the short uh, here shortly. I'm not too sure any day now. Though uh, NewsWithViews.com will also be carrying another article that the two of us put together called uh, "Neoconservatism: The uh, The Cult of uh, the, the Cult of Techno Socialism," and I believe that that article is already up at. At your website right. as as well, and uh, basically, if you just do a Google search of the uh, on, on the on the web, uh, you can find uh, where uh, you know of, of either one of our names. You can find where many of these articles are are and where they've uh, wh- what websites they've been spread around to. Uh, you're listening to the Grassy you Knoll. This is Visigoth with Paul Collins, and let me just do a real quick thumbnail to bring us back to. Um where we broke off the conversation. When we, when we talk about uh, the Venetian oligarchy, we're looking at a continuum that goes back to Cush of the Old Testament through Nimrod, the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, who then set up a city-state, and that is Venice. Is that correct so far? That, that is correct, yes. Now, when we see this seep into England, is this more of a philosophical or a spiritual invasion more than a military one? There, there is a political uh, dimension to the to the takeover in uh, to, in uh, uh, Britain. However, there is uh, there is also more. Uh, there is also a dim- dimension where 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 it's it's more of a philosophical, as you said, uh, the the spreading of an ideational contagion. Um, see, in uh, in the 1600s. There was an aggressive effort on the part of the occult movement, on the part of the Rosicrucians and and the remnants of the Templars, 
to establish dominance uh, in the 1640s. In the 1640s, uh, the Rosicrucians and the Templars began to infiltrate Mason guilds in the British Isles, and slowly but surely, the guilds were shifted away from building and architecture toward the occult beliefs that were established in the mystery reli- uh, uh, schools. Oh, and uh, according to Albert Pike. Uh, the the Templar and Rosicrucian infiltrants uh, concealed themselves under the name of Brother Mason, and uh, we see the, the formation of Freemasonry on the uh, British Isle as being part of a much larger plan to depose the Storts uh, and take over uh, England, because the Storts had become, to an extent, a threat to the Merovingian dynasties of of Europe. And they had to be, re- and it had to be removed. Um, and with the help from Rosicrucian supporters, Oliver Cromwell, who was a Rosicrucian Mason, headed up the English uh, Revolution. And uh, success came for the Rosicrucians and the Templars around 1649, when uh, Cromwell had King Charles Stort, uh, Stort beheaded. And then we, with the 1688 Glorious Revolution, uh, Freemasonry uh, be- entered every walk of British life, and that even includes the church in in, uh, in Britain. And uh, we we saw the complete takeover of the Mason guilds in, uh, I believe, 1717 with the first Mother Lodge, where operative masonry almost became non-existent, and there was a complete shift uh, to uh, to speculative uh, uh, masonry. And uh, since that time, uh, Britain has been used as as a uh, as an outpost, as a as a base of operations for uh, for this movement. You had stated before uh, that you can't help but see this in a spiritual sense, and and I agree uh, wholeheartedly. And it's interesting, I just had a house guest, a listener from out in Texas, who's an atheist, and just this morning, as I bid him goodbye, um, I told him, you know, I'm not trying to proselytize you, but you have to remember this, and that is even if you don't believe in God and Satan, though he says he, he understands good and evil, I said, you got to understand that they, meaning the Illuminati, or however you want to refer to it, believes in something very spiritual and very dangerous. So if you don't, fine, but understand, they do. How do you feel about that? Well, I agree with you entirely. And the problem with being an atheist is you're, is you're, 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 you're the perfect candidate. You're, you're right up their alley. You're, you're heading down the correct path. Because atheism is not so much the disbelief in deity. Uh, that's what some people, uh, where some people get get thrown off, and and they're they're very much put off when I say that, and in, uh, in different uh, conversations and in different uh, social circles, when I have said uh, atheism is not a disbelief in in uh, in deity, they look at me and think, well, gee, what what, what have you been smoking? But uh, but a- atheism is more uh, correctly uh, a belief in emergent deity. It is a belief that there was no God in the beginning. However, mm-hmm. uh, however, uh, there there can be a God in the end, uh, and that God can be humanity if if humanity follows the 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 path to apotheosis and 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 to perfection mm-hmm. and and i realize that not all atheists are are aware of this uh this uh philosophical problem with their b- beliefs and and uh, but but those who uh, who do become acquainted with this aspect of of atheism begin to head down the uh the luciferian path all right now i um when I first encountered the Venetian oligarchy, I kind of had a hard time believing they were any kind of entity at all. They really don't appear too much uh, as a big player in your regular textbooks of uh, world history. However, uh, because this is an extension, really, of Satanism and leads to what will be the Satanic takeover, which is one world government, um, Venice was very much empowered. And uh, because of the spiritual attachment, 
could pull off what they did. That's 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 correct. That's correct. Um, if you look at, as a matter of fact, if you look at any of these uh, these these groups or these uh, or these uh, pestilential ideas, these these uh, ideational contagions, uh, you you have to scratch your head and wonder what's behind their longevity. I mean, they're like the they're they're like the uh, philosophical. Uh, 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 equivalent of a of of a Jack Lalane, you know the 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 fitness uh, phenomena who is now ninety years old and still and still chugging uh, forward doesn't look a day over sixty five, and the only way that you can uh, you, that you can reason that that there is that there that there is such longevity is that there is something that transcends the uh, physical world that we see the world of the senses. Uh, safeguarding and shepherding uh, these ideas and, and these different groups. Well, I mean, and really, uh, and some even even some um, evangelicals look at me with scorn and say, "Well, you know, how can you have this generational, if not uh, millennia long, uh, plan?" And I'm saying, "Now, listen. You told me you believe in Satan. You know he was cast to earth. What do you think he's been doing in the last thousands of years? You know." I mean, he's been to work to try to pull off another revolt. And I said, so if you know that you've got this, the second most powerful, I guess you could say, entity in the universe at the controls, can't you understand how you could have this kind of uh, plot go on as it has? Exactly, exactly. But most 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 uh, Christians, uh, I, I believe I know that with... One church that I was uh, that I was uh, involved in for for a short period of time, there there were people that were in fact involved in the Masonic Lodge that were were members of that of that church, and uh, I was and I you know I spoke to uh, to the pastor of the church about about the my the the research that in the body of literature, and uh, he didn't want to say anything that would set off or or offend. Uh, these uh, these uh, you know members of the congregation that were uh, initiates in, in, into Freemasonry. So there's there's a fear of of being uh, offensive, but but to tell you the truth, we've been we've reached a terminal point in history where where it's more important that we survive and that we that that we uh, make it through uh, victorious. Than it is that we avoid uh, uh, offending anyone. The avoidance of of of, of being offen- off- offensive is actually uh, uh, killing us <laughs> in, really? in, in some respects. And uh, there's a, there's a there there's a, we've reached a point now, uh, and and I'll definitely go into this. You know how how the this this point of history we're in now. Where where we have to uh, be receptive to the truth and have to be uh, sharing that truth and disseminating that truth, no matter who it of uh, who it hurts and who it helps. Uh, we only have about seven minutes left, and what I want to do is uh, uh, ask you if there was a goal um, that you wanted to reach uh, regarding the Venetian oligarchy. I'm thinking perhaps you know what is the current state of affairs uh, with this influence. And if we do have some time after you can answer that, then I'd like to patch a couple of things up with quick questions. So I'd ask you, uh, what, is, what, what is the present state of affairs with this influence? Yes, the most important aspect of this coming out of the Venetian uh, ideational contagion is, is, is depopulation. Um, most people don't realize this, but Thomas Malthus, who uh, who started the whole uh, Malthusian trend and and this idea of depopulation was influenced heavily by a, a by a Venetian known as Giamaria Ortez and uh, Karl Marx was one of the individuals that caught him on this. He, he Karl Marx despised Malthus and said that Malthus had ma- merely plagiarized Giamaria Ortez and Giamaria Ortez held that the earth has a carrying capacity and that that its capacity to to carry uh, a population a sizable population was was finite and 
and uh, the, the, this this prompted many different uh, the people, uh, including uh, Mount Malthus, to hold that you have to do away with with a sizable portion of the mouths to feed. And uh, we now see, as a, as a result of this of of this idea of depopulation that began with Giamaria or Ortez's idea of of carrying capacity, uh, we now see a problem of population implosion. And I'd like to turn the audience's attention to the Christian Science Monitor issue of October seventh, two thousand and four. Uh, it's very important that they get a copy of that and read uh, the, read the article by uh, David R. Francis in in, in it, um, it, uh, it, which goes into this population implosion. You see, we we've now had since Roe v. Wade, which was in 1973, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, 36.5 million abortions here in the United States, and and. Um, instead of seeing a population increase, we've actually seen a population decrease to the point where there is barely a future generation to to uh, generate the 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 uh, monies needed to keep the social security fund going, and uh, and it's looking like um, it's looking like boomers are not going to be able. To uh, to uh, to uh, retire mm-hmm. uh, on on time. As a matter of fact, Greenspan, uh, Alan Greenspan, has come forward and actually discouraged uh, uh, boomer retirement. And even if if we were to get busy now, uh, you know, populating uh, and and procreating to try, uh, the, these children would have to be brought up to mat- maturity. Uh, to to uh, and they're not going to be brought up to maturity to beat out the uh, the uh, social security insolvency, and and uh, this might have played out in some measure to the uh, boomers' uh, advantage. Uh, it's it's a it's a known fact that that continued activity and exercise later in life contributes to longevity and might have actually. Uh, might actually, you know, help people live longer and healthier. But the problem is, is that that many uh, um, of the uh, of the boomer generation has already reached, uh, has already fallen into ill health by by middle age for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is eating food that is totally devoid of any nutrient value whatsoever. You you hear just yesterday we heard that uh, McDonald's is being uh, sued for uh, trans fat that's in their their cooking oil and and how that clogs the ar- arteries and, and people have u- literally made a uh, uh, breakfast lunch and dinner these fast food restaurants and then the uh, the boomers have also uh, they never kicked their drug habit that they had from for, uh, from the days of of the counterculture and the hippie movement, they they merely replaced their their uh, I- illegal drugs of marijuana, LSD, acid, whatnot, with with uh, with drugs that are legal and and deemed uh, deemed uh, all right by the FDA. Drugs such as Prilosect and uh, Vioxx mm-hmm. and uh, Zoloft and, and Prozac. Oh yeah, you just go right on down the line, and 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 they became hooked on these drugs, and now it's being found that these drugs actually do more harm than they do any good to the human body, and they've and and they're very taxing on the human body. I, I'm I'm personally a, a, a believer that that the human body is supposed to last for for a long, long time, hundreds of years. Well, Paul, we're going to have to hold you right there because we're coming up on about 30 seconds left in the show. Uh, we want to thank you for being on with us. Paul Collins, uh, we'll, we will speak again. We're doing a multi-part series with you and Brother